Today I want to talk about large deviations for random graphs. It's mostly some work I did with Sauro Chatterjee a few years back. So what's a graph? It consists of a set of points which we call vertices and pairs of points which we call edges. And we don't distinguish between the pair x, y and the pair y, x. So it's not a directed graph. It's just the pair together that forms an edge. So the n vertices, there's a possibility of n into n minus 1 by 2 possible edges. A graph specifies a subset of these edges as those that are present. So a graph really consists of a set of vertices and some of the edges which are available to you. So those are the edges in the graph. The other edges which could be don't exist. Okay, That's a graph. A random graph is one in which the set of edges is a random set. There are various ways of specifying uh, the probability distribution of this random set. And the elders any graphs are those in which the probability that an edge is selected, is in the set of selected edges, is p. That means the edge is present with probability p and absent with probability 1 minus p. And different edges are independent. So there are no, that's the elders model. Now we are going to keep P fixed and let N go to infinity. In the original model that elders and Rennie considered, P varied with N and typically P was a like constant over N. That means the expected value of the number of edges coming out of a vertex was order of one. It's the constant. Is the number of edges coming out of each vertex. So these are called dense graphs. Or one can think of this graph as also as a matrix. If there is an edge connecting i and j, the ij entity of the matrix is 1. And if there is no edge that connects i and j, that entry is 0. So that's a matrix with zeros in the diagonal because we never have a loop. So zeros on the diagonal. It's a symmetric matrix of zeros and ones. That specifies the graph and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between graphs and these matrices. The matrix notation is useful because you can use it to make some calculations. For example, the trace of this square of A is twice the number of edges. Just do a calculation, it just counts the number of ones. And the trace of A cubed is six times the number of triangles. Okay, so so the, you can use the matrices in order to do some calculations. So the matrix algebra becomes somewhat relevant here. The laws of large numbers hold for this model. For example, if you take the twice the number of edges divided by n squared, the expectation is p. And in fact, there's a law of large numbers which tells you it converges to P. It's very easy here because the, this is sum of large number of random variables which are 0 or 1, independent. So it's just basically Bernoulli uh, sums that you're having. And so the law of large numbers is very easy. The second one, the number of triangles, there's a little correlation because two triangles may share, a, share an edge. But that's only local, so you can compute the correlation, shouldn't matter, and still the law of large numbers is valid. 
So our goal is to prove large deviations for these things. Okay. And also in addition to edges and triangles, we can consider other finite graphs, for example, squares. You know, if, if you look at any finite graph that looks like any shape whatsoever, You know, for example, you can look at something like this. Okay, that's a finite graph. And you can see in your original random graph, how many times does this appear? It doesn't mean that there are not other things in the graph protruding out of this, but this must be there. Such mappings are called homomorphisms into the random graph. And you want to count how many of these are there. So you can count all these things, and uh, <coughs> get a bunch of numbers, and we denote it by T H G. T H G is the number of homomorphisms of H into G. So how many shapes that look like H appear in G? And then n to the power h is the total number possible. Because if we have a complete graph, any choice of h vertices will give you something you want. So everything will be there. So this is the maximum number possible. And if you take the ratio for the red of n, for the Erdos-Renge graph, you can check its p to the power raised to the power number of edges is because you make a random map and all the edges you want should be there. The probability is P that a given edge is there. So the probability that all the edges you want is there is just the P to the power number of edges. So that's a simple calculation. And the law of large numbers is also valid here. Okay. So if you have a sequence of graphs of sizes that go on increasing, you want to talk about what is the limit of this graph. What is it that you want to compute in, from this graph? You may want to compute the ratio of the number of occurrences, number of homomorphisms of type H to the total number that are possible, which is n to the H, and you look at this ratio and suppose the limit exists. They may, I mean, it doesn't have to exist. It's a sequence of numbers between 0 and 1. The subsequence will clearly have a limit that exists. But whatever it is, if the limit exists, you call that limit sigma of h. It's a function of h, different h's. For example, if you look at the number of edges divided by n square, that will give you sigma of an edge. The number of six times the number of triangles divided by n cubed will be sigma of the triangle. So for any shape like this, you will get sigma of that shape. Okay. I'm assuming these limits exist. Since all these numbers are bounded by one, if the limit exi doesn't exist, I can choose a subsequence such that the limit exists. And the only countable number here of such shapes, if you choose a finite number, there is only a finite number of possible arrangements. And you're only looking at finite graphs of this type, so it's only a countable set. So by usual diagonalization procedure, uh, every given any sequence of graphs, of sizes increasing to infinity, there is a subsequence for which all of these limits exist. So that limit is some object sigma, and that's called a graphon. Okay. So the question real is, what does it look like? Is there some kind of a representation for the graphon? Okay. It's a theorem which says that 
any sigma is representable in this manner. Let me explain the representation. So it's an integral in k dimensions, the k fold product of the unit integral with respect to the variables x1, x2, xk, they correspond to the vertices of h. So you should think of each vertex gives a variable to be integrated. There's a function of two variables, which is symmetric function of two variables, defined on the square, which lying between 0 and 1, and and it's multiplied by xi, xj, but only those pairs arise which correspond to the edges. So you take the product of these functions corresponding to all the edges in H, multiply them, and integrate with respect to all the vertices. So the, for any given sigma, there is an f such that for all the H, this is true. So that's the representation of these graph limits or graphons as functions defined on the square which are symmetric and which lie between 0 and 1. Okay. Now you can ask, is this function unique? It's not. It's not unique because if you take any measure preserving transformation of the unit interval and transform x replace x by t of x where t is a measure preserving transformation and use the same t in all coordinates then this integral doesn't change so f can be replaced always by f of t x t y where t is a measure preserving transformation that in some sense corresponds to the fact when you are doing these counts, how you label the vertices is irrelevant. You're just counting shapes and so there's a permutation group on the vertices which is invariant and, the perm and it's the shadow of the permutation group that you see here as measure preserving transformations. That's the connection. So what we are interested in, large deviations. So, so now naturally we are going to do large deviations in a space. The space on which we are going to do large deviations is space of functions on the square. Okay. Does F, does F on the sigma. For each, see. Each edge you have no, no, see. F, is, F doesn't depend on H. I get a function of H, sigma of H. So the F corresponds to sigma. For each sigma, I get an F. So F determines sigma of H for all possible H's, the same F. But if we change different subsequence, we have a different limit, and then it will be a different F. So just to refresh something from large deviation theory, you have a space X, which is some kind of a metric space. You have the Borel sigma field, and you have a sequence of probability measures Pn. And it converges maybe weakly to a some delta function at some point. And then large deviation means you have an upper bound, that 1 over n log of probability of any closed set is the infimum of the rate function over the closed set. And for open sets, you have the lim inf bigger than or equal to minus infimum. And the rate function i itself should be lower semi-continuous and should have compact level sets. That's the general assumptions on the large deviation theory. So in our context, 
Now, we are going to use basically the large deviation we are going to use in some sense is very trivial. It's going to use only large deviations for some sub Bernoulli random variables because our random phenomena is generated by independent Bernoulli. So, we need, all we need to understand is what does large deviation look like for independent Bernoulli. So, but however, there is a little twist. We are, we are going to embed this Bernoulli random variables, 0 or 1, as having a mass at the point i over n, mass 0 or 1. So, I am looking at this sum. Uh, I should, there is a mistake here. Capital N is the same as small n. So, so then you are thinking of it as a random measure. I want to look at large deviation for these random measures. Okay. These random measures in the limit the rate function is infinite unless the random measure is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure and has a density bounded between 0 and 1. Because in our crowd, you know, the, the xi's are only 0 or 1 and they are located at i over n. So, in any interval, you have mass at most the length of the interval or less. So, you, all the densities are bounded by 1. So, you will have, you can't have anything singular. So, all the measures involved in the limit would have uh, absolutely continuous densities that are bounded by 1. And the rate function is just this object, which is the, uh, for each x, if the density is rho of x, for that row of x, you compute the equilibrium leibler information relative to p and then integrate over x. And the proof is quite simple. You just have to compute the moment generating function here, uh, a linear function of this type. And since x's are all independent, this is easily computed. It will be some kind of a Riemann sum whose integral can be evaluated. Whose And the moment generating function of the binomial itself is very simple. It's log, it's just log of p to the p plus 1 minus p. Okay. And then you have to look at the dual of that, Legendre transform, to use the Kramer method of doing large deviations. And if you compute that, you get the uh, information, kullback leibler information. A relative entropy. So, this is the local rate function and then, uh, you know, if you do it for x dependent integrals, you just get the integral of the rate function. Could you show the rate function? Uh, this is on the space of all uh, sub measures. No, it's just, uh, yeah, it could, you see, the total mass here on the expected mass is just p. So, it doesn't have to be a problem. Probability measure means you get, you get a head every time because it's really the proportion of heads. So, think of it as x as being time running from 0 to 1. You are tossing a coin with probability p. You are getting some, some heads, some tails. In every interval, you get a certain proportion of heads and that defines the measure. It's the density of that measure relative to Lebesgue measure. That's what rho is. And the proof itself involves just using Chebyshev's inequality. Any time you have expectation of something, which is non-negative, you can use Chebyshev's inequality to get a probability bound for <coughs> values below a certain level or below above a certain level. That means in a higher dimensional or infinite dimensional context, you have probability for half spaces because the, your expectation of exponential of a linear functional, you get a bound on the probability below or above a half space. But the half space is at your disposal. You can choose any half space you want. So, you have a locally, you have a point around which you want to estimate the probability and upper bound. So, look at all the half spaces surrounding that point 
and you optimize your bound with respect to that and that's naturally the variational optimization that you do to do the Legendre transform and that's how you get to the large deviation rate function by just optimization over half spaces. And the lower bound is just as easy and so on. So it looks as if our problem is over. Right? It's an easy theorem. But we have a real problem because in what topology did we prove the large deviation? In the weak topology. Because you know, when you have an upper bound, the upper bound is local. In order to convert this local upper bound to a global upper bound, you have to do some covering lemma, and you need a finite subcover at some point, so you need compactness somewhere. It's compactness which converts the local bound to a global bound. So the real large deviation, you either require compactness or you need some exponential tightness as they come. It stopped. Okay. So you need <coughs> either exponential tightness or compactness. In the weak topology, you do have compactness because the space of bounded functions on the unit cube is compact in the weak topology as viewed as sitting in the dual of L1, okay, so that's it's fine. Now, but unfortunately weak topology is no good. Well, before we get to that, our problem is actually slightly different because our number of variables is not n but n square because you have independent random variable uh, on one half of the square, so a triangle is all independent sides, so it's n squared by 2, and the space is symmetric functions, I think of it as a function on the diagonal, so it's just a red function that changes a little bit by a factor of one half or something. It's not a serious change, but the main change is the rate is not e to the minus constant times n, but it's e to the minus constant times n square here because the size of the sample is n square. Okay. So if you think of a matrix and be viewed as a function a x y and 0 1, you, you see if you take a matrix, you take a square, You divide the square into n square pieces, and you have the ij cell. If there is an edge between i and j, you put the function 1 in the square. If there is no edge there, you put 0. So the matrix can be embedded as a function on the square by this very just dividing it to int pieces. So you have a random graph now becomes a random measure on functions on the unit square, on a measure on, the, on functions on the unit square. So our space now on which we want to do large deviations is the space of functions on the square which are symmetric, lies between 0 and 1, that's the space in question. So since all our random graphs are embedded there, we naturally have a measure Pn on x. And Pn converges weakly to the delta function on the constant row. That's the law of large numbers. So the question now is, what are large deviations like? <laughs> And 
So we know even the rate function. The rate function we already determined. We have proved it, in fact, the last deviation of the rate function, but we proved it in the weight topology. We are interested in quantities like this because the number of triangles is this. And, you know, there is no much difference because the nature of the functional computing, this is really computing it for the matrices. So we got cubics, we got this kind of objects, well, all kinds of polynomials in A. They don't like weak convergence. So convergence, proving large deviations in weak topology is totally useless for the problem at hand. Because we have polynomials of higher you know, nonlinear functions. So the weak topology. I'll even give you an example to show why the weak topology is not good. Look at the matrix where this is true. This means even numbers have an edge to an odd number, and no two even numbers have edges, no two odd numbers have edges together. So it's a bipartite graph. Cannot have any triangles. So a bipartite graph cannot have an odd cycle. So there are no triangles at all in this graph. But its weak limit is one half. And if you compute the integral for one half, you get one over eight. Because three times one half is one over eight, dx dy over the q over the square is one over eight. So the l limit will tell you that you need n cubed by eight triangles you expect, but you don't have them. That's because, you know, weak convergence cannot handle this. In fact, if we just change it slightly, rearrange the value, but relabel them by Putting all, putting connections between the first half, and first n by two points, you put connections between them, and second n by two points, put connections between them, and, and do some sort of modification like that. And you, and you can alternate the rows. See the first row, you put even, you know, one zero, one zero, one zero, <laughs> or first row, the first entry is zero. So you do something like this. Again, the weak limit is one half. But now the triangle count is okay. So the triangle count depends, the weak limit can be the same, but the triangle counts can be very different. That tells you this triangle count is not very stable relative to weak topology. So weak topology is out. Well, fortunately, there is another topology around, which is the strong topology. Well, when weak is out, we try for the strong topology. Weak topology is too weak. Strong topology is too strong. For the simple reason that in the strong topology, you don't even have the law of large numbers. How can something that zero takes only zero or one convert strongly something which is 
takes all values between 0 and 1. It's just not possible. Some averaging you should allow. And in the strong topology, you don't have any choice. So you need a topology between strong and weak. And that's what's called the cut topology or box topology or something. So we're going to introduce that topology now. So in the in the strong topology, what one does is takes f minus g multiplied by a function h x y, integrate it, take the absolute value and take the supremum over all bounded functions, bounded by 1. That's in fact the L1 distance between F and G. Or equivalently, you can integrate F and G over any Borel set E in the plane, in the square, take the absolute value, and take the supremum over all Borel sets. That's the variational distance as measures f d dx and g dx. They're both strong topology, basically. They're both the same different way, a factor of two or something. Okay. In the box topology or the cut topology, you don't take all functions, but you take only functions that are products. A function of x times a function of y. But you take the soup or all functions h which are bounded by 1, all functions k that are bounded by 1. Or in terms of sets, you take the supremum over all rectangles, e cross f. You don't take all Borel sets, but you take the supremum over all rectangles whose bases are Borel sets in one dimension. So any Borel set on the line, any Borel set on the y-axis, take the product, you get a square or a rectangle, and you take the supremum over all possible rectangles. And that's the box. It's clear that since any continuous function can be approximated by a sum of products of h times k, polynomials are really in the linear combination of such things, it's clear that the box topology is stronger than weak topology. It's clearly weaker than strong topology, so it's something in between. But it's not, the space is not compact under this topology. It cannot be because you can't have two topologies, one stronger than the other, both of which compact. Then some theorem or other will tell you that they're both the same. Okay. And you can sort of see it because if you look at the marginal, if you integrate f and look at the marginal, And the marginal converges strongly. Because that means you replace f by whole space, then e is still all Borel sets. So, so the marginals are converging strongly, only the joint density is something in between. Okay? So that topology. Now, I claim that these functions that we talked about, these polynomial like functions of various degree, highly nonlinear functions, I want to show they are all continuous in this topology. They are stable. The reason is because Each time I leave my 
chalk somewhere. some integral somewhere here is an fn xi xj and the other things. I want to replace this fn by f which is its limit. Now here I can lump everything that involves xi here. There is no function here which involves both xi and xj, because the only function that involves both xi and xj is this, because I only have functions of two variables. And once it involves xi and xj, there is no room for other variables. And similarly, I can separate here all the function, everything that depends on xj. Here, everything depends on xi. Of course, there are lots of other variables here, but that doesn't matter. There's still some function of xi here. I can think of the other variables as parameters. They're all bounded by 1. They're all bounded by 1. And the convergence of this to this is uniform for all these things. So I don't care what they are. Because remember, the definition requires to be multiply a function of here and a function there, and they can be arbitrary functions. So long as they're bounded by one, I can make the supremum over all of those things. So I can replace fn by f, and don't have to worry about what these things are, except this side doesn't involve xj, this side doesn't involve xi. I can repeat this process, replacing one fn by f at each time. And then in the end, I have only f's. And that proves the convergence, and the continuity of this. So that's really what I'm saying. It's in addition to x, there are other variables that doesn't matter. They view, view them as parameters. Now the next question is, is the law of large numbers valid in this cut topology? We saw that the law of numbers, large numbers is not valid in the strong topology. It's valid in the weak topology. If you want to prove the lower bound for the large deviation, it better strong, the strong law of large numbers, be, or weak law of large numbers, be valid in the cut topology. So E, F, B, borel subsets of 1, 2, etc. Well, you know, any subset, finite subset. And basically, this is, if you look at the probability that it's bigger than epsilon n square, this is just Cramer bound that you get it's less than or equal to C epsilon times n square. Because, because there are n square random variables. I mean, you can ask, what if p is very small? There are only very few random variables. Well, if p is very small, you don't care for much. You want it to be bigger than epsilon n square. So, so, so small values of p are automatically taken care of. So anyway, this is true for each given e and f. So what we really want he said, we want to put the E and F outside. You know, we want to, so the soup here is outside, so we want the soup inside. Okay. 
that's simply a question of counting how many such pairs of E and F are there. Well, finite subsets of n numbers are only 2 to the n. So I have 2 to the n e's, 2 to the n f's, so I have 2 to the 2n. But my probability is decaying like e to the cn squared. So there's no problem in putting the soup in. Once I'm able to put the soup in, and that's basically convergence in the cut topology. So the number of such pairs is at most this. Law of large numbers holds in the cut metric. Now one has to think a little bit to justify this. I sort of brushed it under the carpet. E and F are arbitrary Borel subsets. Okay. But your function is constant on intervals. So you really need to worry about combinations of intervals. And you don't have to worry about sets that are obtained by splitting the interval into pieces. Uh, they can be dominated by just the soup over these. Okay. So now the lower bound is easy. Because this argument is not just valid for constant p, it's also valid if my probability p varies slowly with the i. So, so if I think of a function rho that's smooth, and I t think of p of i as rho of i over n, where rho is a smooth function, then it's still true. Now, so what, in order to prove the lower bound, so you have a function f of x, y. And I want to show that you can get your random graph to within epsilon of this function in the cut topology with probability e to the minus n squared times the rate function. So to be able to do that, we need to do two things. You need to use some kind of Gersona type formula, tilt the measure, compute the radonic derivative, and calculate the relative entropy, and get the right bound. That's one step. The second step is to show that the transformed measure satisfies the law of large numbers. Okay, those are the two things that we need to do. So assume that you have a continuous function. That's not a problem because uh, any function which is in L1 uh, it can be approximated by a continuous function in L1. So that's not a problem. So tilt, in the sense that I want to choose a Bernoulli random variables, x, i, j, which are independent, and the probability is rho i over n, j over n for it to be 1. Of course, I don't do it for independent for all i and j, only on one side of the square or on a, recta, on a triangle. Okay? And then use symmetry to get the other half. Can you be more specific what type of what you You give me a function rho x, y. I want to produce a graph for which the function looks like rho. And the function looks like rho basically if I put a random graph whose probability is having an edge connecting i and j look is close to rho of i over n, j over n. That's what I'm. Okay. So I generate Bernoulli random variables with those probabilities for taking the value 1, and I get myself a random graph here. Okay. 
Okay. Proving that this random graph converges with probability nearly one to this function in the cut topology is just like what we did for constant roots, no difference, the same argument. The red function for Ross deviation is like e to the minus n square and, and you can move the soup from outside to inside because the number of times you have to take the soup is of the order e to the constant times n, same argument. So you want to get the original measure Pn gets replaced by this Qn and Qn provides a limit, correct limit in the cut metric. If A is a neighborhood of rho, then Qn A tends to 1. P then I want to show that Pn A behaves the right way. So I do this trick, which is what one. So P and A I write as DPN by DQN, DQN over A. And then I write Q and A in 1 over Q and A outside, that's fine. And DP by DQ I write as exponential minus log DQ by DP. And then I use Jensen's inequality on that portion, right? Uh, see, with this and that and that, that's a probability measure. So I can use Jensen's inequality and the expectation of the exponential is bigger than the exponential of the expectation. Now, this is just an integral. Qn of A is nearly one. So this integral is more or less the same as the total integral and that's really the entropy you can compute. Qn is a Bernoulli, Pn is a Bernoulli with just different p's and you can compute the red on the derivative, you can compute the entropy and you get the rate function. That shows that indeed you have a large deviation lower bound uh, in terms of I rho. The upper bound requires Shimeridi's regularity theorem and we will take it up after the break.